Hey you guys, Tomes of Terror time, and yes, the day has finally arrived. I know I've been promising this since the beginning of the year, like when I did my TBR video, uh, that I was finally, finally gonna get around to reviewing. I don't know, reviewing, talking about, discussing, I'm not really sure if you can even review something like this. The cult classic, do you wanna call it that? Uh, House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danieleski. So my story with this, I actually read this for the first time. I believe my friend Liz gave it to me as a present back in the early 2000s. It, it was actually published in 2000. I think it, it kind of started out as sort of like a, a bit of an, like an online story, like back in 1999 and bits of it circulated. Uh, but then it was actually published in print form in 2000. And I believe I ended up reading it maybe a year or two after that. Cause uh, you know, me and my friend Liz, we had like a lot of the same uh, taste in books and we would often uh, loan each other books and buy each other books and things like that. And she's like, you've got to read this. This is like fucking, this is the craziest, weirdest, like creepiest, most disturbing thing I've ever read. So I read the book and I was, and it really, really made uh, a big impact on me. And I've had it all this time and I kept meaning to like reread it. And I've even in the interim, uh, even though I only read it, you know, all the way through, like back then, I had like been reading all this kind of supplementary material and like watching other videos about it and like other people talking about it. So it's something that never really left my mind all of this time. And so when I first started doing the book review channel, I was like, man, I really have to do a second reread of that because I remembered a lot of the things about it and I remembered like the feeling it gave me and I remember really enjoying the whole kind of like form following function and the whole puzzle aspect of it because I love that kind of shit. But you know, it's so long and so dense and so complex that I was sure that I had missed out on a bunch of stuff. And the thing about this book that's so fascinating is that I kind of feel like if you're kind of willing to engage with it, it's kind of like a shift. It shifts in the same way that the house in the center of the story shifts around. Um, because I kind of feel like everybody will sort of bring their own thing to it. And even if you reread it or you read it in different ways, because it can be read in multiple different ways, which I'll get into in a bit. So it's almost kind of like it's this, it's one of the most meta things that I've ever read, seen, heard about, or anything like that. And the more times that I read it and the more supplementary material, the more kind of like, uh, you know, things I read about it, uh, the more in awe I am of Mark Danielewski's achievement in just making the, I mean, just from my point of view, being a writer myself, being a graphic designer myself, which, you know, that's kind of a big uh, component of this as well. And, you know, it did take him a long time to write. It took him like 10 years to kind of put all this together. And I totally believe it because it seems like every single detail in here, and this is a long ass book. It's like 700 something pages. And there's just zillions of little details, like, and everything, not just to do with the narrative, you know, or the multiple narratives, I should say, but also to do with uh, the fonts and the layout symbols, all kind of stuff going on in here. And it's just so rich that you could literally spend your entire life <laughs> <laughs> like just going down little rabbit holes of various things uh, in this book. And it just blows my mind that one guy like created this. And I'm kind of like, every time I read this book, every time I think about this book, it always makes me want to do, I don't want to do something just like it, but I really, really like, you know, it, it, like I said, this is almost kind of like a, an alternate reality game, but in the like you know this came out came out like in the early days of the internet and honestly even though i believe it started its partial life online um i think that mark danieleski at least as far as i could determine actually wrote most of this by hand again that's kind of like goes along with what happens in the story uh but he wanted to you know, when he finally got a publisher for this, because he kind of like circulated it among friends and things like that, circulated bits of it on the internet, and it kind of got a lot of attention. When he went to get it published, he really insisted that it had to be a print book, and he insisted also that he do 
the entire print layout because he had a very, very specific vision for how he wanted every single thing to look. Because as I said, the look of the book really kind of informs what's going on in the story and vice versa. Uh, so he actually, <laughs> again, as far as I can determine, he actually taught himself Quark Express, was what, what we used to use in the old days uh, before, because I, I had to use that like back in my old graphic design days too. Uh, I don't even think they make it anymore, but uh, I use InDesign now, like Adobe. But uh, yeah, so he taught himself to use Quark Express for the express purpose of being able to lay this book out exactly the way he wanted it because he really had, and like I said, just the more I think about it and the more I go through here and look at all the, like just the attention to detail, it's just like, how the fuck did one person even come up with this shit? It just blows my fucking mind. Like I said, I don't really know how familiar, I kind of feel like everybody was talking about this book, like when it first came out, it made like a massive impact pretty in the horror community and also in the literary community, because I have to say that even though a lot of times this is classified as a horror novel, and I would, you know, a lot of it is, has it has a lot of horrific elements in it, uh, particularly the story that's kind of at the heart of it, uh, you know, one of the main narratives, is essentially a haunted house story, kind of, uh, and a little bit of a cosmic horror, like a Lovecraft type of thing, too. But you could also uh, place this in several other different categories. Uh, you know, it's obviously it's called postmodern fiction, deconstructed fiction. Uh, I've even seen it called a love story, which, okay, I can get, I, I can see that sort of. It's, it doesn't really fit. I, I mean, I guess it's literary fiction, but it definitely, I, I don't think you're, you know, amiss by saying it's a horror novel because it definitely does have a real creepy kind of uh, vibe to it that really resonated with me, I think, like the first time that I read it. And actually this time reading it too, it's just kind of like, it, it creeped me out even more, I think, just because I was able to, I don't know, I guess like imagine it more than anything. Now, there are uh, a group of people, you know, it's, cause this is one of those books that you either think it's the most brilliant thing ever, <laughs> or you just think it's a bunch of meaningless, pretentious twaddle, which, uh, you know, either way, that's fine. I'm not going to get all up and, and just like try and convince them that this is, you know, a brilliant piece of literature or anything like that. If you don't, if you don't feel like it's worthwhile, if you just feel like it's a stunt or it's just kind of like some gimmicky, oh, look at what that dude did. And he just like made this crazy looking book with all his crazy fonts and like, you know, uh, you know, text going in all directions and all this other kind of stuff just to be cute. Then, you know, then that's your opinion. And if you don't really want to engage with the book, then that's totally up to you. I will uh, admit that this book does, it does come across as pretentious, but I think that that was deliberate because I think in some ways it's also like a satire of academic criticism. There's, like I said, there's a lot of different things that you could kind of bring to this, but I will say that if you are going to read it, then you definitely need to work at it. This is not kind of one of those books where you can just like lay down on the beach <laughs> and just like breeze through it. You really got it because there's a million different, like not only is the formatting very, very strange, but there's basically like three or four different narratives going on. Uh, there's all different kind of fonts with different, depending on who's writing or who's talking. And uh, there's footnotes. Some of those footnotes have footnotes. Uh, you know, there's little boxes with like flipped around text. Sometimes you have to rotate the whole book to read it and stuff like that. Like I said, you could see that as kind of like, you know, gimmicky or a stunt, but Honestly, I never really thought of it that way because like I said, you know, I'm a writer and I'm also a graphic designer and I really, really like when the form of a medium, you know, in this case, the form of the book reflects the themes and the story that are going on in the, you know, in the text. And I definitely, definitely think that that is the case here because at its heart, uh, House of Leaves is essentially a story. I mean, at the heart of the story, you have kind of like a labyrinth. So, you know, there's a lot of references to like the Minotaur and things like that. So the book actually is literally a, a labyrinth in the sense that it has all of these little byways and things like that with different footnotes and different things, little stories going on. And they do actually all tie into the main themes. But on the other hand, 
you can go down those paths and maybe some of them are dead ends or you don't have to. You can just kind of like, you know, just read the whole thing straight through. And one thing that's interesting too is I feel like some people that have read it because I kind of feel like people that really love this book read it multiple times because like I said, you know, once you kind of go into it and read it through, I usually just read it right through. I don't because I know some people will go through and read one narrative uh, and then go back and read the other one and stuff because they don't like the way it kind of like interrupts itself all the time, which I get that uh, because sometimes you know, there's these long diversions and you're just kind of like, okay, well, let's get back to that other thing because I forgot what happened. But honestly, I the way it's presented, I'm willing to like read it that way. But I think when I reread it, I think what I'll do is I'll just read like one narrative through and then go back to the beginning and like read the other one through and see how and see how that kind of like changes my perception of it. Because as I said, this is not just... It, it, and I hesitate to even sit, call this like a book review because this isn't even, I'm not li even really reviewing. I love this book, but I understand why well, I understand why other people don't, uh, because like I said, it's not, it's not even like a book. It's like a work of art or like an art installation. And it's definitely something that you have to actively engage with. If you're just going to look at it and be like, nah, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, just, I don't have the time or the patience or something like that, then it's probably like not for you. And that's totally fine uh, because, you know, every, everybody's different. But I love this kind of stuff. Like I said, I love any kind of like ARG stuff. I love surrealism. I love anything that has to do with where you have this kind of like over. I like metatextual stuff. I like symbolic stuff. I like stuff that is not spelled out. And I like things that have multiple interpretations to them, which this book does as well, which I'll probably get into uh, toward the end. So as I said, I'm not real sure because this came out in 2000 um, and it made a really big splash in you know the horror community and also in the literary uh, community and as being kind of this big like, oh, the, the latest thing in postmodernism or deconstructed novel or, you know, it, it was kind of like really hailed as this big achievement, which like I said, I agree that it is. So this many years on, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of uh, discussion about it online still. Um, you know, there I even found like an article from just like a year or two ago. Uh, but since it's 21 years old, I'm not sure how much younger people nowadays are maybe like uh, familiar with it. Because like I said, I've, you know, I, I read it like 20 years ago, maybe almost 20 years ago. And it's so to me, it seems like it's ubiquitous, but maybe some people, you know, don't really know what's going on in it. So I'll kind of like talk about what's going on in it if I can. If I can explain it without sounding like <laughs> like crazy. And like I said, if you haven't read this book, then the way I'm talking about it might be completely um, like it might not make any sense because this book, it's really hard to I think, you know, what's funny. It's like so I'm making this video today. I think last night I had a dream that I was trying to explain this book to somebody. <laughs> So it's like, so forgive me if I'm not super, super clear about it, because this has, like I said, it has multiple narratives kind of going on at the same time. And it's almost kind of like this weird, like recursive, uh, you know, story on top of a story on top of a story. It's like a it's like meta, 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 like on top of, you know, one thing on top of the other. All right. So here we go. Now, one of the narratives uh, concerns and this is the guy that starts it. So he's this guy named Johnny Truant. And he is uh, apparently a tattoo, like he works at a tattoo shop in LA. He's not a tattoo artist, but he kind of cleans up around the place. He makes the needles and all that other kind of stuff. Um, and he also seems like he's kind of like a younger guy. He's like a party animal. Like, uh, you know, he goes out, lots of one night stands, lots of drinking, lots of drugs, stuff like that. So what uh, he also um, very, very early in the narrative, pretty much legit. I can't remember if he says outright, but he pretty much legit says that he's essentially an unreliable narrator. So that's kind of one thing. You're not entirely sure how much of what he says in the book is true. So you have this guy. Now, this guy, he has this friend uh, and fellow party animal named Lude, and Lude tells him about this old guy named Zampano who lived in his apartment building 
and he was kind of this lonely old man and um, you know everybody used to kind of see him he would come out to the courtyard like the same time every day and like feed the birds and there were all these kind of cats like around that he would take care of and stuff and then he didn't um, come out one day so everybody see so, you know everybody got kind of alarmed so they called the uh, authorities and the authorities came and found Zampano dead in there now interestingly when they found him dead they took his body away and underneath where his body was, it appeared that there were these kind of like, could have been maybe claw marks, maybe, on the, kind of in the floorboards, like underneath his body. Maybe not. We don't know how long they were there. But he was dead anyway. And uh, he didn't leave any uh, relatives or anything like that. Nobody knew him. So they were just going to basically throw out all of his stuff uh, that was in the apartment. But Johnny Truant goes in there uh, because the authorities are like, well, you know, we're just going to chuck this shit out because nobody wants it and he doesn't have any relatives. And so he goes in there and he finds this black trunk. And inside the trunk is kind of like there's a bunch of stuff in there, but it's mostly what he's interested in. It is this manuscript called House of Leaves. And... So he decides, he thinks that it's really sad that this guy, Zampano, just died with nobody. And he had done all this work on this, clearly, because it's just like stacks of paper and there's like little cards and like little bits of, you know, of detritus and whatever. And he's like, oh, well, I'm going to take this and see if I can do something with it because it seemed a shame just to like throw it all away. So he takes it and starts going through it. So basically what we're seeing is... The bulk of the book, which most, which I, I kind of feel like is the most compelling part of the book, is Zampano's manuscript. Zampano's manuscript. Zampano had become obsessed with a documentary film, which may or may not exist, called The Navidson Record. Now, this documentary film was purportedly about a photojournalist, like kind of a famous like Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist named Will Navidson and his wife Karen and their two kids, Chad and Daisy, and how they had moved from New York City to a house on Ash Tree Lane in Virginia. And they moved there initially because they're like, oh, we need to get out of the city. And, you know, it's, it's almost kind of like the first part of it is almost kind of like, uh, you know, your standard like haunted house setup. It's like, you know, the husband and wife have been having problems with one another because he's always off, uh, you know, taking pictures like in war torn parts of the world and stuff. She's maybe cheated on him at least once, maybe more than once. Uh, so they there's a lot of distance between them. And so they figure we're going to buy this kind of house sort of out in the country and we're going to sit on the porch and drink lemonade, he says, and, you know, kind of reconnect with one another as a family because uh, Will is a or Navy, as he's called, usually is a photojournalist. Um, he's like, so I decided when we moved into this house that I was going to make a documentary about, you know, just our lives like a family moving into like trying to get back back and connect with one another and move into the country and we just thought it would be kind of interesting so to that end um he sets up a bunch of cameras around the house and um you know they kind of start talking to each other then there's so, so it's essentially like a found footage uh type of situation that's going on uh however not too long after they move into the house, everything seems kind of normal. You know, they're other than the, their, the relationship is a little bit strained or whatever. But, you know, they kind of move into this house. Everything seems normal until they go on this trip and then they come back. And when they come back to the house, they notice that in their bedroom, there is a door in their bedroom, which uh, was not there before, uh, like in what used to be a blank wall. And they open it, and there's actually like a little, like a closet type situation. And there's another door at the other end, and that door opens into their children's room. Now they're like, now we're pretty sure <laughs> that that was not there before. And they're like, and it's not like a closet because there's no racks in there, there's nothing like that. So they're like, huh, that's weird. And then they go back and they check video and stuff from earlier, like before they went on the trip. And they're like, yeah, for sure. There was no door in that wall before. So they're kind of like weirded out by this whole situation. Like, well, okay. So then they kind of try to kind of come to terms with this kind of stuff. And then over the course of 
the documentary, it comes to pass that Will decides, he kind of becomes obsessed with this closet that popped up out of nowhere. And he goes and gets the floor plans of the house. And there is a crawl space on the floor plans, but not the same size as the one that just kind of popped up. And there were no doors on it or anything like that. He also notices that if you measure the outside dimensions of the house and the inside dimensions of the house, the inside dimensions of the house are a quarter of an inch bigger than the outside. And he measures it over and over again. He gets like a friend of his, it's an engineer to come over and be like, what the fuck? And uh, they keep measuring and measuring and they're like, okay, this is physically impossible. And yet uh, they really can't get that discrepancy to go away. Now, as this goes on, shit starts getting real weird. Um, at one point, uh, there's like in the, I believe it's in the living room wall, in the outside wall, like, you know, it's, it's on the inside of the living room, so it's, but it's the exterior wall. Uh, a door, po another door pops up and they open that door and there's a big ass long hallway. And they're like, obviously this cannot exist because if you go outside the house, that's like the backyard, right? So you can't, so you can only see it from the inside. You can't see it from the outside. So as this house begins to essentially expand and shift and, you know, rooms appear and disappear, Will kind of becomes fascinated by this. Cause like I said, he started making a documentary just like about his family or whatever, moving into this house. And then all of a sudden this crazy fucking anomaly pops up. And so he begins to document it. And as the story goes on, the house basically starts to expand to an extent, like I said, where you have some like cosmic horror, like Lovecraftian shit going on, where they go into a hallway and suddenly there's a room in there that's like three miles across. And it's like all this, like floors disappear and there's like nothing in there. It's like all the walls are just kind of like this ash gray color. And so over time, he start he kind of like gets a bunch of people to, uh, you know, friends and like acquaintances of his to go in there and do like explorations to an extent where, you know, at one point there they go to the there's this staircase that pops up like a spiral staircase and it's like 750 feet across and it takes them like a week to get to the bottom and then but it shifts around too because like sometimes you know sometimes it'll take a week to get to the bottom but then one time when will is down and he's stuck down there um he goes up and it's just like a normal size uh staircase so essentially the so you have this documentary, which, like I said, is purported to be a real documentary by Zampano, who was writing an academic paper about this documentary uh, about a house that was bigger on the inside than it was on the outside. However, this paper that was purportedly written by Zampano, who was obsessed with this documentary, basically... Johnny Truant, who's our third kind of like layer of this, who is the one that discovered Zampano's manuscript, dis he finds that he doesn't uh, think that this documentary ever existed or that the people that lived in this house ever existed. And he, so he's not sure because he's like, he's reading through all of Zampano's like manuscript. And it's very funny because it's just like this very, very scholarly uh, manuscript about this documentary and it has all these footnotes and stuff and like some of the footnotes that refer to actual other books like other works and other papers and stuff some of those are real but some of them are made up and uh, sometimes Johnny like points out like which ones are not real like this doesn't exist or you know or, or this quote doesn't come from that from that or something like that so basically you have three layers you have a documentary about a house that's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Uh, this documentary supposedly does not exist. But you have this old guy, Zampano, who is blind, by the way, and he was 80 when he died, who has become so obsessed with this non-existent documentary that he's written this very, very long scholarly paper about it full of references and footnotes and stuff like that to other works that may or may not exist. And then you have Johnny Truant, our narrator, who's basically telling the story to us. And then he is also 
essentially, he starts out like sort of presenting Zampano's work. But then as the story goes on, he starts adding his own essentially like life story. Because sometimes there'll be like something about um, from Zampano's manuscript about the Navidson record. And then he'll and then Johnny Truant will put a footnote and then he'll start like something in in the Navidson record, like reminded him of something that was happening to him. Now, Johnny Truant's story is usually what most people have a problem with because Johnny Truett comes across very much not only an unreliable narrator, but also not all that likable. He comes across as kind of like, I don't want to say like edge lordy, but he comes across as like this young guy. He's like a drug addict. He's always out partying and he's like, and he just constantly interjects with, you know, hey, we went out to this club and picked up these two chicks. And so he's always like talking about like all of his sexual exploits and all this other kind of stuff. And it comes across as like kind of juvenile. But then as the story goes on, and I think the first time I read this, and I think and I think this a lot of people have this uh, experience the first time I read it, is that it's like, oh man, I wish that dude would like stop interjecting like all of his sexual exploits into the story. It's like, let's just get back to the expanding house because that is like the more compelling part of the narrative. But as the story goes on, Johnny's story uh, begins to intertwine and bounce off of Zampano's manuscript about the Navidson record and sort of resonate in interesting ways. And it gets to a point where, because it's interesting too, because there's all kind of references to, I mean, in Zampano's manuscript... There's like a whole chapter that he writes about the myth, the myth of Echo and like Narcissus. And it's all like all about it's not only about Echo, like the character, but it's also about, you know, Echo, like, you know, talking about like acoustics and things like that, because interestingly, it's kind of like this book is sort of like everything is reflecting on everything else. And so it's almost kind of like Johnny Truant's story, even though at first it seems like it doesn't have anything to do with what's going on with the house, is actually reflecting back, like it's echoing back and forth with both of the stories. Like I said, there's also a lot of references to the labyrinth and to the minotaur and there is actually still some debate over who or what the Minotaur actually is, because as the as the Navidson record goes on, when they go into the expanding parts of the house, because like the house kind of stays the way it is, but then like all of a sudden like a door will pop up and then it'll be like these hallways that go like miles and miles in every direction and like huge rooms and huge staircases and stuff. Um, when they start exploring it, they start hearing a noise in there that's like a growling sound and they're not sure if there's actually a creature in there or if the growl is just caused by the house shifting, uh, like if that's the noise of it. And there's some shit that happens later on, like I said, in a much more like kind of horror aspect of the book is that some of the people, because people do actually end up dying in the in the weird parts of the house, like the labyrinthine parts of the house, um, either getting sucked into the blackness or some of them seem to say stuff like they think there's someone in there with them or something in there with them. And this is also reflected in Johnny Truant's life, because even though like at first he's kind of presenting Zampano's work about the Navidson record, it kind of starts to bleed into his own life in the sense that, you know, for example, he'll be at work at the tattoo shop and he goes into the back to get something and he thinks there's like some kind of creature after him. But like then when he turns around, he doesn't see anything. So on its surface, this is almost kind of like, you know, it, it's almost kind of like a story about a guy, Johnny Truant, who finds a manuscript about a documentary but then he starts to get obsessed with it, just like the old guy that wrote the initial one is obsessed with it. And then it starts to bleed into his own life and manifest it into his own life. However, this second time, that, which is kind of the reading I got from the first time, but this second time that I read it, I'm getting to a point now because, like I said, you, you read through the whole thing. And like I said, it's... It's a frustrating read, but ultimately I think it's a rewarding one. But you really, like I said, you really have to pay attention. You really have to 
engage with it, I, you know, kind of like react to what it's like telling you because there's all kind of like shit going on. Like I said, there's multiple interpretations. I've seen multiple interpretations of this and you should go through and read. Um, there's a bunch of stuff. There's indexes. There's all kind of everything in the end of the book. And I don't even remember if I, I might've just like skimmed this when I read it the first time, uh, which is actually was a mistake because this actually is very important. In the end of the book, in one of the indexes or one of the supplementary material things at the end, there's actually a cache of letters that were supposedly written to Johnny Truant by his mother, Pelafina, while she was in a mental institution. And reading through those letters, some of which are coded, by the way, um, some of which you actually have to take the first letter of each word in the letter because it just seems like gibberish. But if you take the first letter, it actually, and she does actually say like in the previous letter that I'm going to have to like figure out how to code the letters because she thought that the director, the like the employees of the mental institution were reading her stuff. Um, so she acts, so some of them were actually coded and like saying what was going on. So there's all kind of that going on back there too. So kind of taken in totem, I've seen like a bunch of different interpretations of this where I, and I don't know, I don't know if I subscribe to this, but the more I've read like, uh, more things about this, the more sense this makes to me. Some theories have it that Pelafina, Johnny Truant's mother was actually the author of this whole entire thing. As in, uh, there was there was a kid named Johnny Truant, but that was her son, but she killed him when he was five because that's kind of a whole thing. Like she did actually try to strangle him when he was five, which does come up in the text. But some theories say that she actually did kill him and then she was sent to an asylum. And so she made up him as an adult. And so all of this stuff was her. Um, I've also heard interpretations that Johnny Truant is a real person um, and that his mother and that he made up all the stuff about Zampano and the Davidson record, like the, or the Davidson record. And that was all him making all of that up. So none of that Zampano or none of that never existed. Uh, I've seen that too. And that was kind of his way of dealing with the trauma. Um, I was watching a thing like Nightmind did like a four hour <laughs> kind of whole thing about this. It's Nexpo, if you want to go check it out. Did like a four hour like examination of this book, like it's in three parts. And uh, he was making the argument that, that Johnny Truant had kind of come up with everything in the book, like everything in the book was a lie, like pretty much everything that he said. Zampano didn't exist, like nothing that was in there existed, but that it was just this whole extended metaphor, you know, the house never existed about his mother, like his guilt over his mother being left in this mental institution and him not being able to help her and him hating her and stuff like that and her, making her into the Minotaur essentially. And uh, so, so the whole thing becomes a symbol of his like crumbling sanity, his mental illness, his guilt, his trauma from childhood in that reading, like nothing exists. Um, you know, or, or nothing like, you know, the, the house of leaves never existed. Zampano never existed. It's all in Johnny Truant's imagination and it's all his way of dealing with his relationship with his mother. So I've seen that as well, which seems like a pretty solid interpretation to me. And then you could even go one more level up and say that nobody, I mean, cause this is one of those things, like I said, this is like meta, 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 meta textual. You could get into a thing where obviously this whole thing is fiction because it's a novel. So it doesn't really matter. Like Mark Danielewski wrote this. And so everything in it is a lie. And I think that in some ways he's very deliberately making a statement about that. It's not really a statement, but he's just kind of like pointing out. And that's what I was saying earlier when um, you could totally read this as like a parody of academia because of the, particularly of the way the, the Navidson record stuff is written where with all these like uh, footnotes and he's always like going into foreign languages like Latin and French and German and everything like that. Like almost like he wants to be like super scholarly on purpose. And uh, so, so you can read it that way as well. But I don't know. It's just kind of like, like I said, it's almost kind of like you can say that it's, you know, an exercise in 
postmodernism and exercise in novel deconstruction. It is all those things. Like I said, if it is pretentious, but like I said, the pretension to me seems more satirical. I didn't get the sense that Mark Danieleski was like, look how smart I am and like and making all these like references to classical literature and, you know, and other things as well, but like making all of these kind of, you know, high minded, highfalutin references. I don't think that he was doing that to come across as like, hey, look how smart I am. I think he was making he was like making I, I think he's like making a joke, essentially. I think it's like a satirical uh, kind of thing. And it's almost kind of like a satirical look at the truth in media. It's almost kind of like a crazy, I was listening to one podcast about this and they said something interesting. They said, do we think, cause this book came out in 2000. They're like, do we think that nowadays in our quote unquote post truth society, is this even all that profound anymore? Since the whole point of the book seems to be pointing out that there's absolutely no way of determining what the truth is. And somebody even pointed out too that the metaphor of the house of leaves, which is this ever expanding house and it just has like with nothing in there, just these black walls and the floors are like apt to kind of like fall away into like bottomless pits and things like that. And uh, one guy was pointing out, he's like, could it be that the house is a metaphor for just like, there's no way of ever getting to the bottom of truth or anything because everyone's interpretation of stuff is gonna be different. And I thought that was like a pretty insightful comment, actually, um, because but you don't have to read it like in this overtly like intellectual way. You don't have to read it like that, because the one part of it that's the Navidson record that's about the documentary, those parts are actually really creepy and are like really it's almost like a really, really scary, like found footage kind of thing, because if you can picture what that would be like, like finding a house that all of a sudden, you know, has, oh, it's like a five mile fucking hallway. And then there's like these big fucking bottomless pits that don't, you know what I mean? And you have to like, you know, these big massive staircases and just like this whole idea uh, that this house just leads into this kind of like other like endless dimension is creepy enough in itself. But as I said, it's almost kind of like, uh, it's it's a visual metaphor to like the whole point of the story where, where, you know, who says where, how do we get to the bottom of anything? Because everything in this reflects on everything else. Everything in this like doesn't exist because somebody just thought of it and then just like wrote it down. And then there's just like these m like multiple layers of, of shit. I kind of get to a point where, like I said, the more, the more I think about it, the more I think that it's kind of a thing about about Johnny Truant's character and about him. It's it's pretty much about him, like I said, which is ironic because when you first read the book, I kind of feel like a lot of people are kind of annoyed by his essentially like interrupting the narrative or like the manuscript that he's supposedly like helping to edit uh, is kind of what, what it starts as. Oh, I found this in a trunk and, you know, I'm going to try and put it out there because it's really interesting. And he got obsessed with it too. But then he starts putting more and more of himself into the story. And I think at first you're kind of like, you know, why is this dude like interrupting like this really cool, creepy shit and everything like that. But as the story goes on, I think you realize that this is actually Johnny Truant's story. Like he's just basically making everything up and it's this multiple layers of bullshit essentially. And it's almost kind of like he's slyly winking at you and saying that that's what it is. But then, I don't know. It's just like, like I said, this is a really, I don't I feel like I'm not really getting across like how fucking weird this book is. This is a weird fucking book, okay? It's like, you know. And so if you haven't read it, but like I said, if you go into it, don't expect it to be like, it's, it's a horror novel. It is, but it's not like, honestly, it's not really that much like anything I've ever read before. Like I said, it's very, very postmodern. It's very deconstructed. It's very frustrating. It's infuriating. It's pretentious. It is all of those things. But honestly, the more I read through it, the more I read about it, the more amazed I am at how, like what a fucking artistic achievement that it, this is, like how much work went into this, how much like into all the, every single detail of like everything reflecting back on everything else, all this stuff about like the labyrinth making, 
you know, the theme of the labyrinth or the theme, you know, at the center of the book and then making everything, the design of the book even, kind of going in with that theme where, like I said, some you go through and like some pages have like, you know, just one word on the page and it's kind of going down if somebody's falling and it's like, you know, or going down into a, like a little tunnel that gets smaller and like these little word squares get smaller and smaller. And it's just like such a cool, uh, it's such a cool experiment in, you know, in art. Like I said, it's not even really, it's a book. Yeah. It's a story. Yeah. But it's really kind of like got so much stuff going on. It's really just kind of like its own thing. And I think that that's why even after all this time, people are still kind of like fascinated by talking about it. And I saw like a million different like forums, people come up with a million different theories about it. Like I said, you know, some of the theories being, you know, Johnny Truant made everything up. Some of the theories being like Johnny Truant died when he was five and this was actually all just his mom's uh, imagination, which like I said, I'm not sure, like a lot of people seem to not buy that one, but I was kind of like, well, I don't know. That does actually sound like it could be kind of, because her letters at the end, and her, those letters actually, I don't know if you guys know, but that was released as their own book. Uh, the letters that are at, at the end of this, plus a bunch of other ones, were released as their own book called The Whale's Tale Letters. And um, those kind of like put a lot of insight into maybe, Maybe Pelafina, the mother, being the author of everything, as in, although there is one part, I did notice this, though, in one of her letters, because like I said, some of them are coded, in one of them, there's a code where she direct she directly writes to Zampano. So some people have said, well, maybe Zampano did exist, but it was Johnny's dad. Maybe, you know what I mean? So maybe Zampano was Johnny's father. So there's all kind of like theories about what's going on in this, but that's the cool thing about it is that, I mean, there are just endless, like it's just endless, endless rabbit holes you could go down. I just find it fascinating how just one person came up with something this complex and something where the form of it, like the the print book, the way that it's printed, uh, you know, the way the text layout is, like all the different fonts, you know, with the different character, like going with the different characters and stuff, um, just ties back into the story so perfectly. And I mean, that's just like so, so cool. And honestly, there's some shit on here too, which I didn't even notice. I saw this on fucking Nightmind. There's all these kind of like collages in the front. Oh, another thing too. <laughs> so notice how the cover of the book is like, the cover, the outside, is smaller than the inside, just like the house. So, see? I love, see, I love that kind of, like, meta little touches like that. See, I probably wouldn't even thought of that, but I just think that's cool. But, uh, so there's all these kind of, like, collages in here. And one of the collages, I can't remember where it is now, but there's one, like, collage in here that has, like, this little thing in the background that has all these symbols on it that are kind of like they teach you. There's, I don't remember if it's, like, some kind of pilot symbols or... Uh, military like exploration or something and in some parts of the book those symbols are used to denote specific footnotes and see I didn't even like notice like I noticed that the, like these little symbols like you know because sometimes obviously like footnotes it's like a number and then like you go and to the bottom and then there's that number but some like later on in the book when you're going to the footnote uh, there's like a little symbol there, like a weird little symbol. And then like, it'll be the little symbol where the footnote is. And I was just kind of like, huh, I wonder why that is. Like I, I thought, well, it must have some kind of meaning, but I didn't really think about what it was. But then like in one of the collages, there's like a little, a little thing that says like what all the different symbols mean. Also, there's some shit in here where there's one part where one of the exploration teams has gone into, you know, the labyrinthine part of the house of leaves and um, they can't get out because it's like closed, cl it basically like closed them in. They can't find their way back out again. They're lost. Cause like I said, the house keeps shifting around. So they're like knocking on the walls and they're knocking like an SOS kind of sound. And they point out in the book, Zampano points out in his academic scholarly research about the Navidson record. He points out that uh, when Navidson, Will Navidson edited the documentary, he edited the, edited those scenes so that they actually spelled, they also spelled out SOS. So like short, 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 long, 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 or whatever it is. And the interest is, so, th so there's that level. And then if you notice in this actual book, the paragraphs that are talking about that are the same. They're like short, 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 long, long, long. So it's just it's just layers upon layers upon layers just like reflecting back upon one another and it's just like this huge layer cake of like fucking so like i said you could go through all 
you, you could spend literally your entire life just finding <laughs> finding little shit like that in this book that'll just kind of like blow your fucking mind like if you want to like you don't have to because i know some people are just kind of like oh my god that just sounds i just want to read a book it just sounds like entirely too much work but see i really like puzzle shit like this if you really like you know puzzle stuff if you like args or something like that if you're into args and you haven't read house of leaves you will probably like really really dig this because this is essentially exactly what it is there's a million million different like little uh, little paths and little tendrils and shit like that you could go down uh that will lead you in all sorts of interesting directions and people have indeed done that and i haven't even like scratched the surface of all of the shit that's going on this like all the references all the repeated things like between johnny truant story and the navidson record story and the zampano story and like you know who's this and that and it's just kind of like just follow just tracing all the references alone would probably take a whole entire lifetime i should note too that uh you know a as if this wasn't kind of like meta enough was that mark danieleski also has uh, a sister named Anne Danieleski, who is in a band called Poe. And they did um, an album. What the hell was the name of it? I can't remember the name of it now. But the album was, uh, the songs are about, uh, you know, a lot of the shit that happens in this book. And in this book, <laughs> there is yet another meta thing where Johnny Truant, the character, goes to see a band and the band that he goes to see is playing a song called The Five and a Half Minute Hallway, which was one of the things that was in the Navidson Record documentary, and is also one of the songs that Daniel Esky's sister uh, put, in her, put on her album. And he goes up to them and says, hey, what's up with that song, The Five and a Half Minute Hallway? Have you heard of the Navidson Record? And they said they'd heard about it. And then they hand him a manuscript of this book. <laughs> inside of this book so it's just kind of so like i said it's just kind of like it's like inception but like times a thousand you know what i mean uh just all kind of crazy shit like that and it's funny because i saw one um i saw one review on goodreads the only review was it was a picture of somebody with the book open in front of their face and then like behind it looked like their head had exploded but it's like, yeah, but if you really, really like that kind of stuff and if you really want to engage with it, like I said, this is not a book that you can just like read in a weekend or anything like that. It's very, very long. Um, you know, it's like, look at the, you know, it's got just like crazy, it's just crazy like formatting. It's just all kind of like the formatting's all over the place. I'm trying to find like a crazy looking uh you know some of the kind of crazy looking shit some of the pages are like almost completely blank there's this kind of stuff here where it's like inside this block it's like you know has backwards text uh from this side so it's like mirror images uh from one another because like i said there's one of the big themes and is like reflections echoes things like that um because one story is echoing the other story so it's just, there's just so much going on in this book that, like I said, you could spend an entire lifetime. There have been scholarly papers written about this shit. Um, it's just, it's really something. So, like I said, it's not the kind of thing you can just, like, sit down and read in a weekend, you know, pick up your cup of coffee and be like, oh, I'm just going to have a good time with this. No, you really have to, you really got to gotta work at it. You really got to put some effort in. Um, I mean, if you want to get something out of it. Like I said, yes, you can just read it as kind of like a creepy story. And honestly, I'm not going to judge you if you just want to go through the whole thing and only read the parts that are about the Navidson record, uh, which are all in Times New Roman font, by the way. Uh, all this stuff with Johnny Truant is in courier font because he is the courier uh, of the manuscript. That's why they uh, made made it in that font. Uh, and there's, you know, all kind of different fonts and they're like connoting like different people's stories. Uh, but if you just wanted to go through and read like the Navidson record, that's like really scary enough on it. It's like a really scary like found footage movie, but also like cosmic horror. But I think it's a much richer experience if you go through and kind of read all of the other supplemental material around it. Because there's other shit back there too. Like I said, there's letters, there's collages, there's poems, there's all kind of stuff um, that is supplemental to this that will kind of like tie back into the narrative. Last I heard, I don't know if this is going through or not, because... Um, I thought that for a while, Mark Danieleski, when this first came out, because like I said, this was a massive, massive success. 
and he was kind of pretty adamant at first. Um, was like, this has to be a print book because the way that it's formatted is so is really so important to the way the narrative unfolds, and it, you know the the way that it looks like reflects on what's going on and the themes in the story. So he didn't really want to do like an ebook version of it. He didn't really want to do an audiobook version. I've seen audiobook versions of it done, but. It, it's really not the same experience. Like I said, this isn't so much a book as like an art installation. So you have to like look at it, you know what I mean, in its print form, in the form that it was intended to be looked at to really get the most out of it, I think. But he was pretty adamant too about, he's like, I don't think this could ever be made into a movie, which, yeah, he's, I, I could see you could make it into a movie, but it would probably have to be like fucking nine hours long. I did hear that he was maybe going to do a series, but I don't think it's actually going to be based on this book. I think it's also going to, it's going to be like a sequel kind of, but I don't know if that's going anywhere. I haven't really heard anything about that, like for the last couple of years. So I don't know if that's ever going to happen or not. I'm not really sure I'd want to see it because like I said, the cool thing about House of Leaves is that th that it's kind of like exists in its purest form, like in its print form. And, you know, as you guys know, I'm a graphic designer and I've mostly done uh, print work. And I really, really like, I really am a big fan of like typography and book layouts and things like that. So, so this is kind of like my... I don't know. This is kind of like one of my favorite things because it's like, it's a great, it's a story, but it also like the look of it just feeds right back into the story. And it's like a circular, uh, it's kind of like a looping thing. And it's like, and it's really, really cool. And like I said, there's just like a million, million little pathways you could take off it. It's very, very interactive in that way. And I really, really like that kind of stuff. If you're into, I'd recommend it if you're really into like ARGs and if you're really into, and if you're willing to kind of, go through a lot because some of it like like I said some of it you can pretty safely skim you know what I mean depending like I said on what you want to get out of it because there's some stuff that doesn't really you know that's just kind of like there for like formatting to sort of like reinforce uh, a thematic element that he's trying so it doesn't necessarily because you know there, like there's one point where there's like little sidebars that just have like lists of names and then they're just like mirrored and it's like so I don't think you need to like read every single one of those because you know you can see like the point that he's making and stuff but I don't know so so just if any of you guys have read it um you know let me know what your theories about it are let me know if you thought it was the greatest thing ever, or if you just thought it was like pretentious piece of crap and it was just like pointless and why did somebody waste 10 years of their life writing this? But it's like, see, I would never think that. Cause like I said, it's to me, it's like a piece of art and it's every time I go through it, I, I always have like a new appreciation for it. Like just all of the amazing fucking detail that went into this is just like fucking blows my mind. And one day I, you know, I would really like to come up with something like this, you know, of this kind of like, because like I said, I love this kind of shit. I love this kind of like graphic design book type thing. I love book la layouts. I love all that kind of stuff. So this is really, really right up my alley. And uh, I was really happy to read through it a second time. And I got a lot more out of it this time, I think, just because I picked up a lot of more stuff that was going on. I picked up the association between the two stories a lot quicker this time than I did, I think, the first time that I read it. Because I think, like I said, like most people, the first time that I read it, I was kind of like, I, you know, I didn't mind the Johnny Truant character I read all of his stuff, but I was just kind of like, why does he keep like interrupting like the creepy shit with the house? But this time I really, I understood like the resonance of one thing bouncing off the other thing and then got to a point where, oh, Johnny Truant is the one writing. This is actually his story. He's actually the main character, you know, even though it doesn't actually seem like that maybe like the first time you read through it. But yeah, if you've read it, uh, let me know what you think about it. We'll kind of talk about theories. I could talk about this book all day long, uh, but I will try not to. <laughs> so <laughs> that'll do it for this Tomes of Terror, and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye.